In the last video, I gave an overview of the course and explained some practical applications of linear algebra. Starting with this video, we're going to dive into the actual course material, and for the first topic, we're going to explore vectors. The first term I want to talk about is scalar. A scalar is just a single number. It could be anything, just the number 3, it could be an irrational number like pi, it could be a variable which we could call, for example, alpha or x. And for reasons that will become clear really soon, we sometimes write a subscript. So for example, here we read this as x1. As opposed to scalars, we have vectors. A vector is an ordered sequence of numbers, just a list of numbers. For example, we have a vector here, and the numbers in here are called the entries or elements of the vector. So negative 11 is the first entry of the vector, and 9 is the third or last element of the vector. Vectors can have different numbers of entries, so this one has 3, so you can call it a 3 vector. This one has 4, so it's a 4 vector, and so on. And the elements, at least in this course, they're all going to be real numbers, but they could be, you know, irrational or rational, any of these, any real number. I can also have the elements be variables themselves. So here, for example, I have uh, the first entry as y1, and then there's y2, and so on. Typically, we write all the variables in a vector with the same letter, and we just change the subscript. Taking things further, we can actually express the entire vector as just a single variable. So here, we have the vector x, and the entries are x1, x2, and so on, all the way to xn. Some of you may have seen vectors written as boldface variables, and this comes from physics or other fields, and sometimes even other linear algebra courses. But for this course, and for a lot of the literature out there that you'll see, vectors are often written just with ordinary italics, just like other variables. The first time I saw this notation, I thought this was kind of weird because it's ambiguous. If you just see an italicized x, you don't know if you're looking at a scalar or a vector unless somebody tells you or you pick it up from context. But actually over time, I've come to strongly prefer this notation, not using the boldface. And the reason is, the boldface type always creates this sort of weird foreign feeling to me. It's like there's this wall between me and the concept of vector math. But by writing vectors in this more casual way, by just writing them as ordinary variables, you get more comfortable with vectors. So I'm going to use this notation for the rest of the course, and I strongly recommend you use it as well, because in a lot of papers and textbooks, you will see it written this way. And after all, vectors really are just variables. Getting a little more abstract here, we don't even need to specify the entries like we did before. We can just write things like this. It's much more succinct. So if you haven't seen this symbol before, the weird E thing you see in the middle here, that is read as in the word in. And on the right hand side we have this fancy looking r. That is just the set of all real numbers. And in the corner we have a superscript n. n is just the number of entries in the vector. So the way you read this top line is x in r n. And in English this means that x is a vector with n entries. And all those entries are real numbers. Bringing this all the way back to the beginning, we can also write scalars in the same way. So the bottom is read alpha in r, and r here is one-dimensional. Scalars are one-dimensional, right? So you can imagine that there would be a superscript 1 in the corner, but we omit it because, you know, it's obvious. Now let's talk about column vectors versus row vectors. So up until now, I've been writing vectors as column vectors, which are the ones that you see on the left here. The entries go from top to bottom, but on the other hand, you have row vectors as well on the right side and the entries go from left to right. So for example, in the top right row vector, the first entry is 15, and the last entry is 1. At this point, you might be wondering, why make a distinction between column and row? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, they're just lists of numbers. But this distinction will become crucial later when we talk about matrices. Actually, there's a mathematical operation used to switch between these two types of vectors. That is the transpose. So we write it with this capital letter T as a superscript, and we apply it to a particular vector. So we have a vector x on the left, we apply the transpose, 
and we get the row vector version of this same vector x. And we can do the same thing for row vectors. So if x was initially a row vector, we apply the transpose and we can get a column vector version of the same vector x. As an implication, if you apply the transpose twice to a vector, you get the same vector back. We've gone over a lot of definitions and terms, but let's take a moment to actually visualize vectors. So a vector is basically a line or a direction. So here we have an example vector where the first entry is 3 and the second entry is 1. And I plotted it here. So the horizontal axis is x1, the first entry, and the vertical axis is x2, the second entry. So we have this pink arrow here and the head, the pointy part, we call that the head or the tip. And the other side, we call it the tail. So the vector takes you from the tail to the tip. Geometrically, you just move along x1 by 3, and you move up 1 along x2. And at this point, you might be wondering, okay, what's the difference between a point and a vector? Well, a vector doesn't have to start at the origin. You can start it anywhere. You can place the tail anywhere. A vector shows the difference between two points. You can move it around or translate it anywhere in the 2D plane. And the same thing applies for vectors in higher dimensions. The important thing is that you don't change the angle or the length of the vector. Those are the two properties that make a vector unique. Let's quickly go over a couple examples of vectors in the real world. The first obvious example is force. You know from physics that force is a vector. And for example, on an airplane, you have at least four different forces that are in 3D acting on the plane. You have lift, which brings the plane up, and you have weight, which brings the plane towards the earth. This is pretty basic, and forces are easy to visualize, but things get a lot more interesting when we consider other not-so-obvious things as vectors. What about movie ratings? So imagine you have a database. This could be, you know, IMDb or something like that, where you have lots of different users giving ratings for movies. So in this case, each user can rate a movie between 1 and 5, and if they haven't seen the movie or given it a rating, they just have a blank there. And we can actually represent that blank as a zero. So think about the first row here where you have user A. And for example, they've given a rating of five to movie A, a rating of five to movie B, and you keep going down and there's a rating of four for movie G. And this row is a row vector. So you could do some interesting things here like trying to predict user A's rating for movie C or movie D. And based on that, you can give the user recommendations for which movie to watch next. We could also look at this from the perspective of one movie. So movie A has ratings from users A through ZZZ. We can think of this as a column vector. And we can, for example, try to predict how user C would rate movie A if they were to see it. So now we have a whole class of problems, ratings and recommendation systems, that can be solved using vectors and linear algebra. The last example here is web search. So Google's page rank algorithm takes into account how many other sites link to your website in order to determine the ranking of your website. So for example, let's say you have a blog and you line up all the other websites on the internet and assign them an index from one through n. If that site has a link to your website, you assign it a value of one. If it doesn't, you assign it a value of zero. So here in this example, site one has a link to your blog, Site 2 doesn't have a link to your blog, Site 3 does, and you go all the way down to Site N repeating that process. The more ones you have, the more links you have from external sites, so it's likely that your site is more popular than other sites. And this means that your ranking will be higher in the Google search results. Of course, the page rank algorithm is a lot more complex than that, but by the end of this course, you'll be able to read about the page rank algorithm and understand what's going on. All right, now that we've developed a little bit of intuition about scalars and vectors, let's see how they interact. So when you multiply a vector by a scalar, uh, usually you write the scalar in front. So here, alpha is a scalar and v is a vector. So alpha times v is just another vector where the entries are all multiplied by the scalar alpha. So very basic, you just multiply each entry by alpha. Next, we have vector addition. So let's say you have two vectors, and the first vector, let's say, is x, the second one is y. When you add them together, you just add the entries. The first entry of the output vector is just x1 plus y1, 
The second entry is just x2 plus y2, and you keep going. Things get a lot more interesting when we talk about multiplying vectors. There are actually different ways to multiply vectors. The first one here is element-wise multiplication. This is also known as the Hadamard product or the Schur product. We write it as a circle between the two vectors. So on the left-hand side, we have x followed by this circle, and then y. And this represents the element-wise multiplication of these two vectors. Both vectors need to have the same number of entries, which is also true for vector addition. You just line them up, and you multiply the corresponding entries. The resultant vector is just x1, y1 in the first entry, x2, y2 in the second entry, and so on. I also want to mention there's an alternative notation where you write a dot inside the circle. Actually, you probably won't come across element-wise multiplication that often. Instead, you'll see the dot product way more often. Uh, this is also known as the inner product, and it's represented as just a dot. So x dot y, the dot product of x and y, is just the element-wise product, but you sum all the entries together. So instead of getting a vector at the end, you actually get a single number, a scalar. So just to spell things out here, the dot product of x and y is x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2, and so on all the way to the nth term. Remember that uh, each of these terms here is just the corresponding elements in the uh, element-wise product. And one more thing I want to mention about the dot product here is that you can write it this way as well. x dot y can be written as x transpose y. I'm actually going to use this form for pretty much the rest of the course, x transpose y. And the reason for that will become clearer when we talk about matrices. So if you write a row vector followed by a column vector, that denotes that you're doing the dot product and the output will be a scalar. All right, so for the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about different properties of vectors. And this is going to build up uh, a sort of tool set. And when we actually start looking at uh, formulas and algorithms involving vectors and matrices, uh, these tools are going to come in handy for uh, doing proofs, rearranging things, and developing intuition about things. So the first property I want to mention is the norm. The norm of a vector is just its length. We plotted a vector as an arrow, so the norm is just the length of that arrow. It's just the square root of the sum of the squares of the elements. This should look familiar. The Pythagorean theorem is just this formula, but for n equals 2. And note that this is the Euclidean norm, as opposed to other types of norms, which we'll talk about later. And there's one interesting way that we can rewrite this. So if you look at uh, what's underneath the, the square root, this should ring a bell. This should look something like we just covered. So it's actually the dot product of x with itself. So x1 squared, for example, if you just write it as x1 times x1 plus x2 times x2, it becomes more clear that this is actually the dot product of x with itself. Now you see how a lot of these building blocks that we've been talking about over this video are starting to all connect with each other. The next property I want to talk about is the angle between two vectors. So there's a simple formula here. And the angle is the inverse cosine of this uh, fraction here on the right side, where the numerator is the dot product of x and y. And the denominator is the norm of x times the norm of y. So if you remember from trigonometry, uh, the inverse cosine has a range between 0 and 180. And that makes intuitive sense, because if you have two arrows, those arrows can line up perfectly, so the angle between them is 0. Uh, they can be completely opposite. So they line up, but they're facing opposite directions, so that would be an angle of 180. They could be perpendicular, so they're 90 degrees. Or they could be anything in between 0 and 180. And if you go past 180, then basically you're winding back around, so that's like, um, for example, let's say you, you uh, the angle between them is 270, if you look at it from the other way, it's really just 90. So it makes sense that uh, it makes sense to use inverse cosine here. But this formula is kind of unwieldy. It's actually better if we rearrange this. So let's take the cosine of both sides and then move the denominator to the other side. Now we'll get this. So the dot product of x and y is equal to the norm of x times the norm of y times the cosine of the angle between them. Stop and think about this formula for a moment. So if theta, the angle between x and y, is 0, then cosine theta is just 1, 
so that part disappears. And we're left with the dot product of x and y is equal to the norm of x times the norm of y. So these two vectors are perfectly aligned. Now think about what happens if theta is 180. That means cosine theta is minus 1. So we get the same thing except we have a minus 1 in front of the uh, norms. And if theta is 90 degrees, then cosine theta is just 0. So the dot product of x and y is 0. They're perpendicular. And as theta varies from 0 to 180, we go from positive towards 0 and then eventually into the negative. Basically, the dot product tells you how aligned two vectors are. So let's visualize this. If the dot product is greater than 0, then theta is somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees. So this is basically an acute angle. On the other hand, if the dot product of x and y is negative, then theta is between 90 degrees and 180, so the angle is obtuse. These next few concepts might seem abstract, but they're very useful and very practical. These concepts will show up over and over again over the rest of the course, so if they don't click immediately, don't worry. A subspace is a set S. That is a subset of Rn that satisfies these two constraints. Note that I didn't use the weird E symbol. I, I'm using the C looking thing. So this actually doesn't mean in. It means a subset of. So when you're talking about sets, you use this subset notation here. But for vectors or points or scalars, you use the in. Because those are individual elements in a set. Whereas here, we're talking about the whole set. So anyway, let's talk about these two constraints. So the first constraint is, for any pair of vectors x and y in S, the sum of x and y is also a vector in S. So in math speak, it's x plus y in S. For all x, y in S. So this means you take any two vectors in S, if you add them together, they will always be in S. So the second constraint is that if you have a scalar alpha, and a vector x in s, then alpha times x is also a vector in s. So in English, take any vector in the set. If you scale it, that vector is also going to be in the set. So there are actually terms for these two constraints. So the first one, we say that s is closed under addition. You add any two vectors, you get a vector that's still in the set. The second constraint is that s is closed under scalar multiplication. You take any vector in the set, you multiply it by a scalar, it's still in the set. So any set that satisfies these two constraints will be considered a subspace. So to give some concrete examples here, think about R2. So that is the two-dimensional plane, the infinite plane. And that's the set of all two-dimensional vectors. So you take any of those two vectors, any of them in 2D space, and you add them together, you're still going to get just another vector in two-dimensional space. You take any other vector in two-dimensional space and you multiply it by a scalar. So you stretch it or you shorten it. It's still a vector in two-dimensional space. So you never leave R2. And that means that R2 is a subspace. You could say that for R3 or R4 or Rn. But here are some less obvious subspaces. You could have a two-dimensional plane embedded in a higher dimension. So imagine you have five-dimensional vectors, but they only cover a two-dimensional space. I'm going to come back to this idea at the end of the video, and it'll be more clear then. So one very important example of a subspace is a span. The span of a set of vectors is the set of all linear combinations of those vectors. So at the bottom here, we have uh, a formula representing this. So you have k vectors, v1, v2, vk, and the span of this is just taking all possible scalars, so all possible real numbers, you get k of these, and you multiply them with the k different vectors, and you add them together to get a new vector. And you keep repeating this process for all possible combinations of the alphas. It's the entirety of the space that can be produced by scaling the different vectors and adding them together. So it makes sense that you would call this the span. So for example, if you have two vectors, let's say the first vector has uh, entries 0, 1, and the other vector has entries 1, 0. So this is basically the uh, Cartesian coordinate plane, right? So you have one vector representing the x-axis and one vector representing the y-axis. So with these two vectors, 
you can combine them in different ways. You can scale them and add them together, and you can get all of R2. You can get the entire Cartesian two-dimensional coordinate plane. So the span of those two vectors is R2, and we know that R2 is a subspace. So spans are actually always subspaces. The next concept here is linear independence. So once again, let's say we have a set of vectors, k vectors, and they all have the same number of entries, let's say n. We say that these vectors are linearly independent, or just independent, if none of the vectors in the set can be expressed as a linear combination of the other vectors. Okay, what does that mean? Let's take, for example, v2. If these vectors are linearly independent, this means we can't take v1, v3, v4, all the way to vk. We can't take those vectors and scale them and add them together to somehow get v2. So getting a little abstract here, there's an equivalent way to express this condition. So instead of expressing it in English like this, there's a mathematical way to formulate this. So before I explain the math here, I just want to cover two points related to notation. The first one is the arrow you see in the middle there. So the arrow goes from left to right. That means if then. You can also read it as implies. So if the left hand side is true, that means the right hand side must be true. It does not imply the statement is true in the other direction. The second point I want to go over is the zero on the left hand side. So you see uh, alpha 1, v1, uh, and all these terms, and they equal zero. This zero is actually a vector of zeros. It's a vector with the same number of entries as the other vectors, but all the entries are zero. And this is an obvious point, but I just want to be clear here because if you just look at zero, you can't tell if it's a scalar or a vector. You have to look at the entire equation, and then you can figure out is it just a scalar or is it a vector filled with zeros. So let's talk about the actual math here. So imagine you have some set of scalars, alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way to alpha k, and you scale the corresponding vectors and add them all together. If this linear combination of these vectors equals the zero vector, and these vectors are linearly independent, that must mean that the alphas are all zero. Why is this true? Okay, think about it this way. Let's say some of the alphas are not zero. That means that some of the vectors must cancel each other out in order for them to sum to the zero vector. If they can cancel each other out, that means that at least one of the vectors must be in the span of the other vectors. So to be concrete here, let's say we have v2 and we're trying to cancel it out. So we find some combination of alphas so that v1, v3, all the way to vk, when you scale them with the corresponding scalars and you add them together, you get something that equals minus v2. So now you have v2 being cancelled out by minus v2, and you end up with a zero. That's the only way this can work. You can repeat this thought experiment for the other vectors, and you'll see that every time, you'll have to combine some vectors to cancel out the other vectors. This means that one or more of those vectors is in the span of the other vectors. This means that the vectors v1 through vk are not linearly independent. So this condition down here is actually a very succinct way of explaining the English above. Let me give a more intuitive definition of linear independence. A set of vectors is independent if removing any of the vectors would make the span smaller. So you have some vectors, v1 through vk. If you took any of them away, then the subspace produced by those vectors is going to shrink. So let's say you have three vectors, and just to make things simple, uh, they are the three axes of the Cartesian coordinate system. So for example, first vector is just 1, 0, 0. Second vector is 0, 1, 0. Last vector is 0, 0, 1. So these are perpendicular to each other. And you can make any vector in 3D space by just scaling and combining these vectors. If you took any of them away, you would be left with just 2D space. That means that these three vectors are independent. Okay, if we say this another way, if you have a set of linearly dependent vectors, so notice I use the word dependent here instead of independent, so this is the opposite. If you have a set of linearly dependent vectors, then removing one vector won't change the span. You won't lose any information. To give a concrete example here, let's say you have 2D space, and you have one vector that's 1, 0, 
another vector that's 0, 1. So again, just the x and y axes. If you have a third vector with also only two entries, so let's say the vector 1, 1, this vector actually makes the set of three vectors linearly dependent. You have three vectors in 2D space. And this makes sense. I mean, it's two-dimensional. Why do you need more than two coordinates? You don't need more than two directions, right? If you have a third vector, of course, this is redundant. So if you have linearly dependent vectors, at least one of them is redundant. If you take away the 1, 1 vector, the third vector we just mentioned, you won't lose any information. You are still in R2. The span of those vectors is still R2. Actually, if you have a set of linearly dependent vectors, you can produce a set of linearly independent vectors by removing one vector at a time from the set and seeing if the span changes. You keep removing vectors until removing one more vector would actually reduce the span. At that point, you know you have a linearly independent set of vectors. Alright, last concept here. Basis. So once again, we have a set of vectors, v1 through vk. This set is a basis for a subspace S, if these two constraints are satisfied. So the first constraint is that the subspace S is the same as the span of these vectors. The second constraint is that the set of vectors is independent. Okay, let's think about what these two constraints mean. The first constraint says that you have the set of vectors, you take all possible linear combinations of these vectors. That's the span of those vectors. That is the same as the subspace S. The second one is that you don't have any redundant vectors. So taken together, this means that this set of vectors, these k different vectors, completely describes the subspace S. And it does it in a minimal way. You don't have any redundant vectors. This means that any vector in the subspace S can be represented uniquely as a linear combination of the k vectors v1 through vk. So that's why this is called a basis. It's basically a coordinate system for the subspace. One important thing to note here is that you can have lots of different bases for a given subspace. You could have an infinite number of bases. So for example, for the subspace R2, you could have two vectors, 0, 1, and 1, 0. Those are just your Cartesian axes, right? So those two vectors form a set that's a basis for R2. But you could have other vectors as well. You could have, for example, a set of two vectors where the first vector is 1, 1, and the other vector is minus 1, 1. All right, so this is just like the coordinate axes, but you've rotated them by 45 degrees. So that seems kind of weird, but those two vectors form a perfectly valid basis for R2. Those vectors also don't need to be perpendicular. They can have a very small angle between them. It doesn't matter. You could have the vector 0, 1 and the vector 1, 1. And there's an angle of 45 degrees between them, but that's fine. You can express any vector in R2 using just those two vectors. So the important property here is that the number of vectors in any basis of a given subspace, S, is always the same. So note that in the R2 example, uh, I always gave sets of two vectors. Right. So this number, the number of vectors in any basis, is the dimension of S. And we write this as dim S. So for R2, the dimension is, well, 2. For R3, it's 3. And this is pretty obvious. I mean, think about the word dimension. Now let's go back to the idea of subspaces embedded in higher dimensional spaces. So you could have a two-dimensional subspace in a five-dimensional space. So for example, let's say we have vectors uh, of five elements each, so we're in R5, but we just have two vectors, and these two vectors form a plane, a 2D plane. So that 2D plane is actually a subspace, and the dimension of that is 2, and we would have exactly two vectors in any basis for that subspace. So we covered a lot of definitions and concepts in this lecture, but we've already built a very strong toolset we can use in future lectures. Next time we'll look at some Python programming, and we'll explore some of the concepts we covered here about vectors in NumPy. Also, as a very practical application, we'll look at the k nearest neighbors algorithm in scikit-learn, and we can completely cover the algorithm using just the concepts we covered in this video.